So welcome again, everyone. We are here today for our second session of this series. We will talk about Kashrut, and we welcome our speaker, Rabbi Haim Winner. Okay. So good evening to everyone. And as uh, Wanda said, this is the second of a three-part series. And we called the series the Halakha of the Future because uh, that's, that's, we really want to look about what's going to happen in Halakha in a world which is changing very quickly and which many of the assumptions that uh, went behind the traditional Halakha don't work anymore. Last time we looked at uh, Shabbat and we asked ourselves what happens to Shabbat in a world where everything is automated and people don't actually work. And tonight we want to talk about Kashrut. And the big question tonight is what will Kashrut look like in a world where the food is grown in laboratories or gets printed in 3D printers and uh, the traditional means of production of food don't uh, apply anymore. So that's our big question. And of course, it's a very big question. And uh, in terms of methodology, I want to use the same methodology we did last time, which was to go back to the Torah and to try to identify the key values that stand behind the, the subject of uh, Kashrut. And the assumption is that even if the reality changes, the values don't change. And when you come to decide what things need to look like in the future, you have to ask yourself, how do you translate those values into the new reality? So that's going to be our methodology. And we'll start by looking at some of the core verses in the Torah that talk about uh, Kashrut. But before I start, I have to point out a very big difference between the subject this week and the one we looked at last time. Because when we were looking at Shabbat, the truth is that Shabbat is indeed one of the central ideas and one of the central values of the Jewish tradition. So, and I already talked about uh, the, the Shabbat's mentioned over 30 times in the Torah. And it's possible to say, this is Shabbat. This is what Shabbat is about. We came to the conclusion that the, not the not very surprising conclusion that uh, Shabbat in its essence is about being a day of rest. And then we went into trying to define exactly what does it mean to rest. Kashrut is not the same as Shabbat. Kashrut isn't a single value and isn't a single idea. Kashrut doesn't really appear in the Torah. There's no overarching idea or value of Kashrut. Kashrut is a selection of different laws and different regulations that impact on the food that we eat. But there's no reason to assume that all of those rules and regulations share the same values or are trying to teach us the same thing. So it's possible that the value that stands behind separating meat and milk isn't the same as the value that says that you're allowed to eat a cow and you're not allowed to eat a pig. <clears throat> we have different rules and those kind of we decided to lump them together and to call them a category but the torah doesn't put them together and call them a single category from the torah's point of view it's just a collection of different laws and as we know there are many laws in the torah and in a way our classifying them and putting them together is somewhat uh, artificial so we'll be looking at some of the laws around Kashrut, and we're not even going to talk about all of the laws around Kashrut, because as, uh, <clears throat> as I'm sure that you're aware, some of the laws of Kashrut appear in the Torah, and we'll be talking about those tonight. But there are many other rules and regulations that were added by the rabbis, and again, not like Shabbat. In Shabbat, the rabbis added more rules to help us enforce the idea that it's a day of rest. But with Kashrut, the rabbis added rules because they had their own ideas. They're not necessarily to enforce the values of the Torah, 
but to add extra rules and regulations according to the values of the rabbis. So it's, it, it really is quite a different thing. In any case, the methodology is going to be to go back to the Torah and look at some of the key values. Then when we collect it all together, we'll ask ourselves, well, how are we going to apply this to a world which is a different world? So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to uh, uh, once again, go back to the Torah and we're going back to Genesis chapter one, just like last time we went back to Genesis chapter one. It's so exciting for me to see that because uh, I think that the real basic values are, are, are all in the first chapters of the book of Genesis. We read these things and we just, they're, they're nice stories and we forget that uh, kind of in these stories, the Torah is trying to convey its, its, its idea of how the world is constructed, is it constructed, what it's really all about. And I'm going to Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 31. And these are the verses that uh, talk about uh, the creation of people, right? And the first question I'm going to ask is, where are we supposed to be vegetarian? And I'm reading these verses because uh, I know lots of people who are vegetarians or religious people are vegetarians, including my children, some, some of my children. And they all come back to these verses to try to show that the, the ideal in the Torah is a vegetarian ideal. But these are the verses, this is what it says. And God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male and female he created them and god blessed them and god said to them be fertile and increase fill the earth and master it and rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and all the living things that creep on the earth so god creates people male and female and he gives them he he, he tells man that he will fill the earth and master it. He has control of the universe, very important in terms of uh, how the Torah understands our relationship to the world. And we rule the fish and the birds and all the living things. And God said, see, I give you every seed bearing plant that is upon the earth and every tree that has seed bearing fruit, they shall be yours for food, right? So. They're, they're told what they can eat, and what they can eat is a vegan diet. They get the plants, and they get the trees, and they get the fruit. So the, what, what people are designated to eat isn't just a vegetarian diet, it's a, it's a vegan diet that they're told to eat. And to all the animals on land and all the birds of the sky and everything that creeps on the earth on which there is the breath of life, I give all the green plants for food, and it was so. So the vision, the, the vegetarian vision, the vegan vision, isn't just for people, but it's for all the animals on earth. Everyone's to eat the plants and to eat the vegetables, but uh, not to eat each other. And God saw all that he had made and found it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And uh, so, so that's the creation on the sixth day. And as I say, the vision is a vegetarian vision. And if the Torah had ended after Genesis chapter one, then that would be the end of the story. And we would say that indeed we're supposed to be vegetarian, but uh, uh, the Torah doesn't end there. It continues. And if you remember the, the plot of the story, at the beginning of the book of Genesis, everything is good, as it says, right? God saw everything that he made, and it was very good. Right? It was very, very good. But by the end of the, the Parshat Breshit, uh, the whole world becomes wicked and evil. The, 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 the the soul of man is evil from his youth and there's much evil upon the land 
and God regrets having created the world and he wants to destroy everything. So this perfect world that, that, that everything is so perfect in it, by the, by the end of the, the, the beginning, the opening, already that world is broken and already that world doesn't work and God decides to destroy that world and to create another world. And then you get to Parshat Noah. And when you get to Parshat Noah, God comes to the world and he causes a flood, flood and everything dies. And only Noah survives together with the ark and with the animals that are in the ark. And they come out. And when they come out of the ark, there's a new world. And the world after the flood, the world after the destruction, isn't the perfect world of the world of creation. And again, God speaks to this group of people, to, to Noah and his descendants, and once again, he blesses them, and he gives them instructions about how to live in this world. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, be fertile and increase and fill the earth, similar to the blessing for Adam. The fear and the dread of you shall be upon all the beasts of the earth and upon all the birds of the sky, right? All the animals are gonna be afraid of you. You're going to rule those animals. They're all going to be afraid of you. Everything on which the earth is astir and upon all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. The animals are given now to the human race and every creature that lives shall be yours to eat. As with the green grasses, I give you these. So after the flood is where it changes. And after the flood, God gives the animals to, to mankind. And God says, these are also your food. The question is, why, what has changed? And why does God change his mind? And the answer can only be that since the first world that God created failed, God's trying to learn the lessons of that failure and create a world which is actually going to succeed. And why did the world fail? Such a perfect world. How could it be that it failed? And I don't know. It seems to me that sometimes when you set your expectations too high, you're doomed to fail. That if you're only looking for perfection, it's very hard to be perfect. It's very hard to come to a place of perfection. And I guess in the, the, the analysis that God makes after the first creation is that the expectations were more than people were able to do. And they were set up to fail because the, the expectations were so high, you had to fail. And when you fail, then, then it just brings you down. And uh, uh, in, it, it, it's not that instead of 100%, you do 90%. It's instead of 100%, you end up doing 0% or 2% because you're, you're, you just feel like you're a failure. And God, instead of creating a perfect world, creates an imperfect world. The world after the flood is by definition an imperfect world. It's one that doesn't have all the values that we would like, but it's one which is obtainable, that it's possible to actually achieve. And uh, the big difference of, of, of all the differences that come after the flood, it singles out that now you can eat the animals, but with a caveat, with, a, with one exception, right? Every creature that lives shall be yours to eat, as with the green grasses. I give you all these. You must not, however, eat flesh with its lifeblood in it. You're not allowed to eat the blood. You're not allowed to eat flesh with its blood. But for your own lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. I'm not sure what that means. I, 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 right, you're not allowed to eat flesh with its blood, 
for your own blood. I'm very concerned. I will require it of every beast of man too. Our requiring a reckoning for human life of every man for that of its fellow. So it's as if God says, uh, these are very obscure verses, but it's as if God says, I'm allowing you to take the life of animals, but I'm not allowing you to take the life of other people. The life of other people remains sanctified and remains holy, and you're not allowed to take a life, another human life. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in his image did God make man. So there's something playing at the end that you're allowed now to eat meat, but you're not allowed to eat blood. Blood is unique and blood is special. And uh, that brings us into the next of the rules around kosher. So the first rule, right, I, 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 I called this, are we supposed to be vegetarian? And somehow there was an ideal of vegetarianism that was tempered by reality. And the reality is that we eat meat and the Torah has more rules about eating meat than any other area of kosher. The rules in the Torah about how you eat meat, it's very perturbed and it's very concerned about how people eat meat. It's not so concerned about how you eat vegetables because we, you just eat the vegetables, but it's very concerned about how do you eat meat in such a way that doesn't turn you into a monster, that, that, that still reflects in some way a set of values. So that's in Genesis. And now I'm getting to four big rules and regulations that appear in the Torah around Kashrut. The first one, I'm just connecting back to what I just said. And that is that there is an absolute prohibition of consuming blood. You're not allowed to eat blood in any shape or form. And you know, I'm sure that you know, in the preparation of kosher meat after the slaughter, the first thing that happens is you have to remove the blood. And there's lots of rules about how you soak the blood and how you salt, uh, how you salt the meat and how you soak the meat and how you do everything to make sure that you're not having blood because blood is, uh, is, is a central prohibition. And we read in Leviticus chapter 17, and it says, any man of the house of Israel are the strangers that sojourn amongst them who eats any blood I will set my attention, Venatati Panai is the Hebrew word. I will set my attention upon the soul who eats the blood, and I will cut him off from his people. And now, a really obscure, difficult verse for the soul of the flesh is in the blood, and I have therefore given it to you to be placed upon the altar to atone your souls for it is the blood that atones for the soul. And therefore I said to the children of Israel, none of you shall eat blood, and the stranger who sojourns amongst you shall not eat blood. So there's an absolute prohibition of eating the blood. Why exactly? It says because uh, the blood goes on the altar for atonement. Indeed, the blood goes on the altar for atonement, as I say, it's a difficult verse to understand. There's one modern commentator by the name of uh, Jacob Milgram, who put forward an interesting theory that, but we, we normally, when you read this verse, the idea is the sacrifices go on the altar in the temple and they're used to atone for your sins. So instead of eating the blood, use the blood to atone for your sins. But uh, Jacob Milgram suggests that the reason that you, the blood is going to the altar to atone for your sins is it's coming to atone for the sin of having killed the animal. In other words, every time you slaughter an animal, the blood goes on the altar to ask for forgiveness for the fact that you've killed that animal. And indeed, in the time of the Bible, Right. Nowadays, people eat meat all the time, but in the time of the Bible, eating meat was very, very unique and very, very special. And in the time of the Torah, at least, it changes towards the end of the Torah. But at the beginning of the Torah, the idea is that slaughter would take place in the sanctuary and is part of religious ritual. 
And then after that, you, you could come and you could end up eating the meat. But to slaughter an animal just to have a barbecue, that, that wasn't the way the Bible thought of it. You slaughtered an animal as part of religious ritual because the only justifiable excuse to slaughter an animal was to, to serve God who created life to begin, uh, uh, to begin with. But I want to push it a little bit uh, uh, further. When I kind of step back and look what's happening here, the way I understand it in a kind of uh, uh, anthropological kind of understanding is that the blood represents life, right? Uh, blood is life. And when you slaughter the animal, there has to be a process that changes an animal, a living thing, into meat, which is just a product that you can buy in the supermarket. You have to take the animal, you have to take its life out, and then what you have left behind is a product. And I think that the, the ritual here of draining the blood is about uh, converting Right, taking the life out of the animal and turning it into something which is dormant, which is, which, which is neutral, which is a vegetable now, which, which doesn't have the holiness of life in it. Now, that, that might be strange and weird, and that might seem impossible, but I think ritually, that's what's supposed to happen here. The, the Torah doesn't like us eating animals it doesn't like us eating living things so if you want to eat the meat you have to make it stop being a living thing and you have to be able to remove the the unique holiness of life from it in order to eat it and that remains that's the prohibition against eating blood which is kind of one of the key things and when we get to values the value of life somehow plays in our idea of what you can eat and what you can't eat. I move on. The, the next category we have in Kashrut is the idea that there are clean animals and there are animals that aren't clean. And uh, I'm not sure inherently why it's one or the other, but uh, in Leviticus chapter 11, we're very familiar with uh, the Leviticus chapter 11, there's a list of animals that you can eat. And everyone knows, right, speak to the children of Israel, the creatures that you may eat amongst all the animals on the earth, any that has a cloven hoof with completely split into double hooves, which brings up the cud, you may eat, but you shall not eat those who bring up the cud and have a cloven hoof, the camel, etc., etc. And you have all the rules. You have the fish with the fins and the scales, and you have the birds uh, with a list of birds that you're allowed to eat and you're not allowed to eat. And if you uh, would, would want to know why the Torah bans these certain animals and not other animals, the term that repeats itself over and over is, for instance, in verse 8, you shall not eat their flesh, you shall not, not touch their carcasses, they are unclean for you. The, the words that the Torah uses is that some animals are considered clean animals and some animals are considered not clean animals. What makes an animal clean and not clean is, a, is, is an interesting thing. The animals that you can eat, right, objectively speaking, uh, an animal that has a split hoof is an animal that walks on grasses, that, that uh, kind of that structure of a foot is for walking on grass, and an animal that chews the cud is an animal that eats grass. Grass is actually very difficult to digest, so the vast majority of animals can't digest grass, so right? people if, 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 if you were left without any food and all you had was the meadow, people couldn't live on grass because our stomachs aren't able to digest the, 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 the grass. And the, the four stomachs that go over and over again and digest uh, are for, for digesting grasses and uh, uh, grains and, and that kind of thing. And there's no kosher animal, which is an animal of prey that eats meat. So somehow, uh, uh, 
being a tame, domesticated animal that, that eats mainly grass, that there's something in the vision of that's what a pure animal should uh, look like. And the, and the fish is exactly the same. The, the fish with, with, with fins uh, are the fish that live at the top of the water. The fish that live down at the bottom of the ocean and eat all the dirt at the bottom don't have fins and scales. So, so there's, there's the, the, the very mobile fish that, that swim in the clean waters are the, the fish that you're allowed to eat. And the birds, even though there's no principles in the birds, there's no bird that's a bird of prey, which is included in the list of the, the kosher birds. So somehow being peaceful is, is part of this picture of uh, 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 the animal that, that, that you're allowed to eat. Because I guess that the Torah has an idea that you are what you eat. That if you eat an animal which is a warrior, you'll become a warrior. If you eat an animal that's mean, you'll become mean. There's this kind of idea that, that, that you are what you eat. It, it matters what you eat. It matters what you consume. Right? And if, if anything, that's something that uh, maybe in our society, we, we start to, we try to think about more that what we consume what we consume matters our choices about how we consume our ethical choices their their moral choices it matters and the torah from day one says you have to it's not just about feeding yourself what you eat is a reflection of your values and you will become somehow tainted by what you eat and therefore eat the animals of uh, uh, peace the the rules appear again in the book of deuteronomy in Deuteronomy, slightly different. The, the key phrase in Deuteronomy isn't clean and unclean, but holy and unholy. I'm just reading the verses. You are children of the Lord your God. You shall not gash yourselves or shave in front of your heads and because of the dead. You are a people consecrated to the Lord your God. The Lord your God chose you from amongst all people on the earth to be his treasured people and you shall not eat anything abhorrent, right? Anything disgusting, the, 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 that's it. These are the animals you should eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle. It goes on and gives us all of the rules again, and it ends, you shall not eat anything that has died a natural death. Give it to the stranger in your community to eat. You may sell it to the foreigner, for you are a people consecrated to the Lord your God. That, that eating special food is part of what it means to be holy. And the, the choice of kosher animals and not kosher animals is somehow connected to the idea that you're a holy people. That, that there's an exact correlation between the animals you're allowed to eat and the animals that can be brought to the temple as sacrifices. Right? The, the, and an idea that permeates the Torah is an idea that the, the people of Israel are, are, are people of priests, we're a nation of priests. And if you're a nation of priests, you have to eat the food of priests. And the food of priests are the clean animals. It's, uh, somehow that's all connected uh, uh, together. So there's a value that, that you don't eat everything. You have to select the best, and you only eat the best because you're special. And that's uh, the second value we see. Two more. One, there's only one verse it mentions it. It says, you shall be a holy people to me. The flesh torn in the field you shall not eat. You shall throw it to the dogs. Right? Basar, basadet, trefa, lotochelu, la kelev tashlichu notam. That word trefa, uh, uh, you might know the word treif, which comes to mean not kosher. But in the Torah, trefa, uh, it, it flesh torn in the field, it means something that's already dead. It was mentioned all, all, already before that you're not allowed to eat uh, uh, a, a, an animal that's already dead, roadkill. You can't just go and collect the, the roadkill. You have to slaughter the animal specifically for the purpose of eating it. 
And the whole idea of shechita, of kosher slaughter, comes from this verse. And the rabbis pulled a lot more out of the verse than you see in the verse. So first of all, the, the, the shechita is the, the animal needs to be slaughtered in a certain way. It needs to be very fast. It needs to be painless. Uh, that, that, that's part uh, uh, of it. And the third rule is that the animal needs to be healthy at the point that you slaughter it. And uh, it, it, immediately after Shechita, I don't know how much you know about Shechita, immediately after Shechita, the first thing that the Shochet does is he checks the animal and makes sure that it, the 18 different tests that need to be done to, to, to make sure that the animal is considered healthy, is considered viable. Big discussion in many European countries around the, the question of stunning an animal before it's killed. And uh, one of the big attacks on, on, on kosher meat is around the question of stunning. The reason that we don't stun an animal is it needs to be healthy at the point of slaughter. If you're stunned first, then the point that the animal is, 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 is uh, is, is being slaughtered, it's, it, it's wounded. And you're not allowed to eat a wounded animal. You're only allowed to eat a healthy animal. Lots of interesting things about that. I'll just point out that uh, usually animals that are used for kosher slaughter need to be raised in relatively good conditions. The kind of mass factory farming where you crowd animals together to be too crowded and you give them lots of antibiotics so that they don't kill each other, they don't get too uh, unhealthy. An animal like that's not going to pass the, the check of the shochet when they, when, when they check it. Uh, one of the tests that they do is they check the lungs just, uh, out, of, out, of, out of curiosity. And if the animals had pneumonia, which what happens if it's too crowded when it's kept together, then that causes uh, scars inside the lungs and uh, that animal won't be considered kosher. If the, if the if Shochet puts his hand in and he feels the lung and if the, the lung gets smooth, then in Hebrew, they call that chalak and in Yiddish, they call that glot. And if you ever heard the word glot kosher or basar chalak, the meaning of glot kosher literally is that the lung was smooth, everything's smooth. There's no, no questions about it uh, uh, whatsoever. So the, the animal being health, uh, healthy, also an important principle. I get to the fourth principle and then we can, we'll move on to the second part. But the fourth principle is three times in the Torah and Exodus twice in the book of Deuteronomy. It says you shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk. And the fourth principle is the separation between meat and milk. You're not allowed to have meat and milk together in any shape or form. It's considered the most serious of all the rules of kashrut because the Torah repeats it three times. So there, there are three different prohibitions connected with meat and milk. You're not allowed to eat meat and milk together. You're not allowed to cook meat and milk together, even if you're not eating it. So if you want to get a job at McDonald's making cheeseburgers, you're not allowed to do that, even if you don't eat the cheeseburger, because you're not allowed to cook them together. And you're not allowed to make, you're not allowed to profit from mixing meat and milk together, even if you don't eat it and even if you don't cook it. So you're not even allowed to buy shares of McDonald's to, because you'll be making money from the cooking of meat and milk together. An absolutely very strong uh, 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 prohibition. Why the Torah doesn't give us a why? But uh, many commentators have talked about the, the fact that a mother's milk is supposed to nurture its child, it's supposed to care for its child, it's, it's supposed to bring it towards its future. The Torah sees the juxtaposition of using the mother's milk in the death of the child as, 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 as being impossible, as being abhorrent, as being something it doesn't want to, to, to see at all. And more likely than not, it's a specific pagan practice at the time of the Torah. They're playing with life and death and the juxtaposition of life and death through sacrificing uh, an animal together 
with its mother's milk was part of the ritual at the time and the Torah hated it, absolutely hated it. But because it viewed it as a form of idolatry, the rules of meat and milk follow the rules of idolatry and not the rules of kashrut. And that's why we, we not only don't eat meat and milk together, we have separate pots and we have separate pans and we have separate plates and separate cutlery. And, and all of that mishagas that we have around it is, is that the, the, the Torah absolutely hates the idea of the, of the mixing meat and milk together and that uh, pagan practice. Those are the rules that you have in the Torah. The rabbis added a lot more rules. I'll say two minutes about that, and then I want to, to, to talk about new food. So the rabbis added some of the things, you know, prohibitions against uh, 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 cheese and cooked food and wine that have come from a non-Jewish source. And uh, they've added all kinds of uh, uh, extra prohibitions. And all of those are added for sociological reasons, not for, not for value reasons. But, but, but particularly for sociological reasons, that to keep Jews separate and to emphasize uh, uh, that they're a unique and special uh, 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 community. I want to move on. So if all of the rules about kashrut or all the rules in kashrut in the Torah are about uh, meat, what happens when we stop eating meat? What happens when the world moves to new forms of meat? If you look at the market today, there's basically two kinds of, there's two directions that the technology is moving in. One is the direction of plant-based foods. So if I go into my supermarket today, I can buy many products that are inspired by meat products but they're not meat products anymore. The, the burgers and the sausages and the minced meat and all of those things I can get in a vegetable form. And once upon a time you get them in a vegetable form and they, were, they looked like vegetables. But nowadays more and more they work on making the flavor exactly the same flavor and the shape exactly the same shape and the taste exactly the same taste. So, so nowadays you can get a vegetable equivalent to many uh, uh, meat products. On the surface, there's no problem with uh, this whatsoever. Uh, if you can make it out of vegetables, it's vegetables, and there's no question that, that such things are kosher and they're vegetable, they're not meat. Right? So, so if I have a veggie burger, no one comes and says that a veggie burger is actually a meat thing. The more interesting uh, uh, development are the, is, is, is growing food in laboratories, growing meat in laboratories. There's now uh, developing processes of uh, cultured meat, which still exist in the laboratories and the, the, the first generation of these things are just coming into the supermarkets in some products. And the lab-grown meat has a different technique. The lab-grown meat takes cells from a living animal and it puts it in a culture so that the, the, those cells grow in culture dishes inside laboratories. And they do all kinds of things to try to give them the, the texture and the build of meat so that, so, so that it tastes exactly like meat. And it is exactly like meat. It is exactly like meat because it's exactly those cells which came from a cow or came from a pig or came from a goat or whatever animal they chose for the beginning of the manufacture process. And the, the lab-grown meat raises all kinds of interesting halachic questions. And I'll say just a few things of the, the, the kind of questions that the rabbis ask when they look at that kind of meat. And then we'll go back to our values thing and we'll, we'll, we'll see what, what, what we think will actually happen 
as it goes on. So there's at least three big halakha questions about uh, uh, the lab-grown meat. There's the small questions about, are you allowed to do that to begin with? Are you allowed to, to go, go to an animal and pull out some of its cells and start to grow it into a laboratory? Then we have to ask ourselves, what about the food which is used to feed those cells? And are there any questions around that? Just to give you an idea that in the laboratories, when they grow these, these meat cells, they have to give it the kind of nutrients that you need in order to grow meat. And what kind of nutrients do they get? Most of the nutrients are actually come from animals. So it's animal blood and it's uh, all kinds of things like that, which are used as the growth medium mm -hmm. for, the artificial, for, for the artificial meat, for the lab grown meat. So <clears throat> I, I, I don't know how to say it, but you're having lab grown meat because you don't want to kill the animals to make your meat. But a lot of animals are involved in creating the growth medium, which is used to grow the cells to make the meat that you didn't need to kill in order to, to, to grow it. And so the, the, the question is, does that matter? Does it matter if I take cells from a cow and I'm growing it in blood from a pig, or I'm growing it even in blood from cows that aren't kosher cows, that, that does the growth medium actually matter? And of course, the big question is, is it meat? If I said that one of the big prohibitions is mixing meat and milk, does meat which comes out of a test tube really count as being meat? Do I have to separate between it and the milk? milk that comes from a test tube, which is also possible, or does that become irrelevant? So each of those questions is a big halakha question, and uh, literature has been written about each of them. So let, let, let's start with the harvesting of the cells itself. So the, when it comes to the harvesting of the cells, the main halachic problem is something called Ever Menachai. Ever Menachai is one of the prohibitions that we actually read this evening in the book of Genesis when we were reading at the, at, at the very beginning, the sons of Noah come out of the ark and God says, uh, from now on, you're allowed to eat meat, but you're not allowed to eat meat with its lifeblood in it which was interpreted by the rabbis, is you're not allowed to eat meat from a living animal. What's meat from a living animal? Meat from a living animal is when you come to a living cow and you decide, I'll just cut off one of its legs and I'll eat that. Or I'll just take out its kidneys and I'll eat that. And, and that's called ever minachai. And that's absolutely prohibited. And the, the, that's, uh, that, that prohibition is what's called mitzvah bnei noach. It's one of the seven core commandments for all human beings. It's, it's, it's not a mitzvah of the Torah. It's a mitzvah for all mankind. Now, if I'm not allowed to take a part of a living animal and to, to, to consume it, am I allowed to take cells out of a living animal and start to grow them to make lab-grown meat. And, and, and is harvesting the, sh the cells already part of the prohibition of uh, uh, taking something from a living animal? It's, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's an interesting halakha question. Now, that question in and of itself is related to all kinds of other halachic questions because the cells that they take for the meat are what you call stem cells. Stem cells are cells that uh, <clears throat> haven't started to differentiate yet and they have the potential to become lots of different cells. And the stem cells uh, are, are, are from a very early stage of the, the, the development of, of, of the animal. 
and the halachic questions around stem cells are very much connected in, in, in the news today in America. There's lots of discussion about uh, abortion. Is abortion allowed or not allowed? Uh, uh, what are the moral implications of abortion? But the, the question of what you're allowed to do with stem cells is not only connected with with, with with extracting cells in order to create meat, but also connected with those questions of what do you, what do you view, view the, the the status of uh, of of cells that have the potential to become something else uh, uh, to begin with. <clears throat> Interestingly, halacha and the rabbis have much less concern about cells at the very beginning before they've actually developed and they became become something. The, the, the Talmud refers to that as mayim ba'alma, is just water. And the cells before they become too developed aren't really considered by the rabbis to, to, to have the status of a living thing and aren't considered by the rabbi, right, that it doesn't have consciousness, it doesn't have structure, it, 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 it doesn't have anything yet. And just like the rabbis don't take a lot of time thinking about uh, 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 amoebas or mold or, 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 or those kinds of things, the, the rabbis don't really consider stels, stem cells to be something of uh, uh, moral significance. And as a result of that, they don't consider the harvesting of the stem cells to be what we call ever menachai. It's, it's just nothing. Because the truth is you can ex extract those cells without having any effect. If, if I cut off a cow's leg, then it doesn't have a leg. If I remove some cells from, from, from within the cow, it doesn't notice that loss whatsoever. So the majority of the rabbinic opinion is that you are allowed to harvest the cells and that's not considered amputating something from the, the, the body of the animal. Is it meat? That's a very interesting uh, uh, halacha question. The general principle in halacha is anything that comes from a pure animal is pure, and anything that comes from an impure animal is impure, right? We know, for instance, that the eggs of a kosher animal are kosher. The eggs of a non-kosher bird aren't kosher. The milk of a kosher animal is kosher. The milk of a non-kosher animal isn't kosher. The general principle is that, is that status goes on. And uh, we would expect that uh, we, we, we would expect that something that comes out of a cow will continue to have the same kind of status, and we would con expect it to continue to be uh, uh, considered meat. And uh, that, I imagine, is going to be the halachic consensus at the end of the day. You're not going to end up having a, a, a burger that you can put on the grill, but it's going to be considered parv. You can have the plant-based burger considered parv, but if it comes from meat, it's going to be considered meat. The growth medium is a very interesting question, and uh, it's discussed in the Talmud in all kinds of other different uh, contexts. If, for instance, uh, right, the, the Talmud uh, talks about a situation where uh, a farmer has a cow and he only feeds this cow bread. It's a cow that likes to eat bread. And the question is whether the milk from that cow is considered kosher lepesach or is considered chametz. Right? If, the, if the cow only eats chametz, what's the status of its milk? And the answer is that it's just milk. That the chemical processes that are involved in uh, breaking down the food 
and traveling through the cow and eventually becoming its skin and its bones and its muscles and uh, and part of that also its milk. It's, uh, the milk is what we call a davar chadash. It's a new thing. The milk, right? There's a point where it becomes chemically detached from what was there before. And it's considered an absolute new thing. And I would imagine that the growth medium that you use for, for making this artificial meat has exactly the same status. It doesn't matter where it comes from. At the end of the day, the chemical process by which it's absorbed by those cells and turned into cells, make it a davar chadash, make it a new thing. And it's no longer considered uh, a continuation of what was. So it would seem to me that when you start to grow meat in laboratories, what you come out at the end of the day is going to be meat. And uh, it won't matter how it's grown in the laboratory and you'll be allowed to do it. And I imagine it's going to be considered kosher. That I think is uh, the, the, the analysis that comes out of it to, to begin with. But is that really what's going to happen? That's an interesting uh, thing. I hinted in the, the first part of my lecture that the rabbis added lots of rules and regulations around kashrut because kashrut plays not only a religious role in our lives, but uh, uh, kashrut also uh, plays an important part in the structure of our society. People, the people eat kosher because it's the way they identify as being a Jew. That uh, uh, the separation of meat and milk has been such an important thing in our lives. I don't see a situation where, the, where Jewish society is going to allow that part, something so central in the life of Jewish people to disappear because of the changing technology. So I expect that even if you could argue that all lab-grown meat is kosher, there's going to be a separate kind of kosher lab-grown meat. And if you would ask me how they make it, it will be made exactly the same way, but the very first cell will have come from a kosher animal rather than from a not kosher animal. I suspect it's going to be something like that because I can't see Jewish society letting go of the idea that there's kosher meat and that there's uh, non-kosher meat. And I suspect that whatever you argue about these things, the meat is going to be meaty, the, the separation of meat and milk is going to continue, that even when our food has nothing to do with animals, the basic parameters of the kosher kitchen are going to stay because they serve such an important social and sociological, anthropological function in Jewish society that no one is going to want or no one is going to allow those roles to, to actually disappear. So, you know, we, we, we are at the beginning of, a, of what I call the brave new world. And in that brave new world, I think the, that a lot, of the, a, a lot of the food that we recognize today is, 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 is going to change. And there's going to be new methods of production and there's going to be new kinds of farm, but, but Jewish society isn't going to change. And our needs as a society aren't going to change. And I imagine there'll be a whole new set of rules and regulations, but my guess is that we'll end up looking not that different from what the, the, the kosher kitchen looks like today. I'm open to, to questions if people have some questions. And then, uh, <clears throat> right, and, and, and uh, then we'll finish. Uh, Tzvi left a question on the chat at the beginning when we were discussing the first. Do you see it or do you want me to read it? If you can read it, it will be easier for me. The verse in Genesis says, fill the earth and master it which refers to humans and implies that humans can be both vegetarian and non-vegetarian as well. Right. 
So, so, so uh, the, the question is what's meant by mastering the earth? I think because the verse that follows specifically says what you're allowed to eat, then the verse before that doesn't refer to, to what you're allowed to eat. The, but, but the idea that you master the world has very important implications for, for kind of Jewish philosophy and how it thinks about the how it thinks about the world. Just if I give you an example, there are some religions that frown upon medicine. They frown upon medicine because if God wanted you to, you to be sick, then <clears throat> you'll be sick. And if God wants to heal you, then God will heal you. And why do you intervene? in that. Judaism doesn't buy that kind of philosophy because we were told to master the world. The idea that you learn science, the idea that you can manipulate, manipulate the universe, the idea that you could discover new ways of doing things, the idea that, uh, that we have control the world and want to control the world is all derived from that verse that says our role here is to master uh, world where we're, we're not passive in the world we're very very active in the world and uh so, so it's a really important verse in our our relationship to the to science right uh, J judaism is very open to science it's very open to new ways of doing things it's very open to to, to medicine it's very open to manipulate all of that openness comes from uh, the, the perception that comes from the verse to master the world. So that's an important verse, but it's not a verse which is talking about food. Excellent. Thank you very much. Else? Anyone else would like to comment, ask via chat, or you can unmute yourself and, and talk. Okay, so okay. If, if we don't have more questions, uh, one last remark, Chaim? Yeah, no, my last remark is that I'll see you again in two weeks time. And the, the third, it's gonna be different than these two because the third one is talking about the, the structure of family and the structure of marriage and the, 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 the new change in social norms. And the reason it's gonna be so different is that the world has become so different that uh, <clears throat> I kind of there'll be much less to look at the historical sources and much more to reflect on kind of what do we do, kind of uh, public policy, what do we do in a world which is uh, uh, changing so much. So but, but hopefully it will be interesting and I think that it will be very challenging. So thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. And we will uh, see you again in two weeks' time, I hope. Laila Tov. Thank you. Laila Tov. Thank you.